just six times. So, well, I'm out of it. So, well, it'll be easier. It'll, it'll be easier soon. Uh, but, yeah, so, uh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. No. It's uh, it's really great to, to come up here and, and get a chance to talk to all of you guys. Um, as probably nearly all of you know, I'm newly arrived in Australia. I'm very happy to be meeting other Australian mathematicians and Australian operator algebraists and get the hang of what's going on around. So the the talk today. Uh, it's the subfactors as quantum symmetries. I'm going to start by telling you uh, sort of some of the basics of what subfactors are, and then uh, spend a while telling you about how uh, subfactors are a, are a good place to think about finite groups and finite group actions, and how subfactors can be used to record the finite groups and finite group actions. But then the, there's a lot more in that same little world. Uh, in the same sorts of objects that capture finite groups capture other strange objects don't come from finite groups, and uh, these are the, the quantum symmetries, the, some generalized notion of finite groups that I'm going to try and uh, explain uh, hiding in the world of subfactors. So let's start right back at the beginning. You can complain if I tell you uh, either things that are too trivially easy or uh, that you might never work before. So, uh, okay, so a factor, let's start with that. A factor. Moment algebra and trivial symmetry. Now, a moment algebra is the commutative form, the very opposite of standard space. I just, uh, I just measure spaces. I mean, the commutative for moment algebra is just uh, the, the measurable functions of some measure space. And so we're really here at the, at the, the other extreme away from, from the measure theory. And in fact, uh, you can take any one moment algebra and write it as a sort of direct integral over some, over some measure space with a, a factor sitting above each point in that measure space. Uh, although, to my knowledge, that's not actually a very useful integral. Okay, uh, but nevertheless, we're going to focus on, on factors in the moment algebra and trivial symmetry. So it turns out there's a nice classification of factors, and let me show you these and, and then, then also feed you into some examples. Classification of factors coming from types. The first one is type one n, and these are just the n by n measure cells. And even when we're talking about the other scarier sorts, I sort of want you to keep this in mind a lot of the time, and uh, realize that everything else in this table shares a lot of the beautiful properties. Plain old simple finite dimensional algebra. Uh, uh, this one infinity is uh, just bounded operators on an inseparable Hilbert space, just like the IP, infinite version. And then there's the type that we're really interested in, which is the type 2 1 factors. So I'm going to tell you some properties of the 2 1 factors, uh, which in fact characterize them, and I'll give you a very explicit example. So there's a trace, and I've got some algebra with the trace, and uh, traces of projections. I give you all of the integral from zero to one, which is very unlike back here, where, where uh, traces of projections are just integers. Now we've got a funny normalizing so the identity has trace one and everything else is some real number integer zero and one. And let me just tell you some ways in which this differs very significantly from the finite cases. There are no minimal projections. That is underneath each projection, you can find something a little bit small. But on the other hand, unlike the one infinity case and like the, the finite one n case, all of the projections are finite meaning that they never, no, no projection is equivalent to a uh, to some subprojection. So in the in B of H, there's just something called the shift operator, gives you uh, an, an isometry from the whole Hilbert space to some some uh, proper subspace of it. Uh, so the identity isn't a finite projection. In this case, everything is a finite projection. So 
that's something that's extremely nice. But, you know. Okay, so we just go ahead and say what numbers are contained in the numbers for to infinity. And then we add these numbers. Okay. So it's not going to touch it all today. Because everything fits in there. So we're going to, for the rest of the day, just do the two numbers. So in particular, Moment algebra called this is hyperfinite. Okay, so what the TSO algebra should always call approximately finite. It's a means meaning that it's sort of a limit of finite dimensional thing. So there's a unique hyperfinite two one factor, which we're going to call R throughout the talk. And you can think of this as being a limit of the the powers of two by two matrices. So you can uh, take two by two matrices and uh, embed that in four by four matrices just by uh, taking each entry and putting it in as a as a as a block or as, as a, yeah, that, that number times a, that, that two by two identity. And you can put four by four matrices up in eight by eight and so on and take this to the limit and appropriately complete it so it's actually a one moment algebra. And this is the this is the, the hyperfinite two one factor. So you really should just think it's sort of Sort of the, uh, like, an, like an infinite version of, of matrix algebras, but uh, it actually has a, uh, if we can give it a nice trace, namely, uh, if we think about the trace on two by two matrices as being this half of the normal trace, so the identity is trace one, and then you have a trace on the four by four matrix algebra as a quarter of the normal trace, the identity always has trace one, you get a trace on the, uh, on the completed object, and it, uh, and it has all these. So this is the gag that that uh, that we all will care about a lot of the time. This is a sub factor. Let's call that a subgroup. This is just uh, an inclusion of factors. <coughs> One factor sitting inside another factor. And if I neglect to specify what sort of factor I'm never talking about for the rest of the talk, just fill in the word two one for me. Okay. So why on earth would you care about these kinds of factors? What, what, are, what on earth are subfactors for? Well, the title of my talk, a uh, to justify the whole way they describe quantum systems. Very much like finite groups. It will take a while to get to that. I'm going to go first go on a bit of a detour to uh, to the interaction of finite groups with factors, and then to see how how they describe classical systems. Which is really what we're going to look at. Okay. So uh, Jones. That the, this hyperfinite two one factor is extremely nice in that uh, any finite group, any finite group G, uh, you, well, you can set it up so that it acts by, by outer order morphism. Two one factor, and it does this essentially uniquely. Give me a unique number of the functions. I mean, of course, the two different ways have the same finite group act outerly on this guy. Uh, there's always just some unitary that turns one act into another. Okay, so this is this is sort of nice. Um, you you might think of this as sort of being somehow. A little bit related to uh, the Galois theorem. So, so, so uh, finite extensions of rationals have a Galois group acting on them. But different field, I mean, uh, given a single field, there's only one group that acts, and the same group can act in different fields. 
whereas in this case, somehow there's just kind of only one, only one thing going on. We're only ever talking about R. You can make every finite group act on it, and that action is, is, is essential. Which is, that's maybe already a clue from this talk. It's nice to think about groups. But when you think about groups, the action is always right or wrong. Ah, yes. And Okneanu, just a few years later, kind of dramatically extended this, and I, I forget the addresses of the Okneanu code that they dropped. Dropped the one that was in the Okay. So given this setup here, a finite group and an action, we would have a finite group. Let's consider a subclass that would be very easy to categorize. The hyperfinite two word factor sitting inside the semi direct product of uh, the hyperfinite two word factor and this group action. So here you can think of the, 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 the elements in this algebra are just either the elements of the, uh, of the hyperfinite two word factor or the linear combinations of the group element. And when you were to commute a group element past uh, an element of the, of the hyperfinite two word factor of, of R, you use the specified algorithm that you use in this case. So that this construction here, a semi-direct product, is, is just running a semi-direct product of one group action and one action. And uh, it's easy to see that the root that R sits inside there just is always going to be the same as the root that sits inside the new new Okay, so this is an example of a subfactor. I guess maybe a little bit of exercise to pull out the Guys, um, that this semi-direct product is a two-one factor in here. Work out why it's in the center and so on, and what the base is. But that's you know, you can do that. Okay. So given this guy, what we want to understand is uh, wait, can we recover? Can we see the group actions that we start? Can we see the, 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 the group actions we start? And so the strategy to do this, to, to recover some symmetry group back out of a, a subfactor, is going to be to analyze the bimodules of these two things. So let's, uh, let's analyze Hilbert spaces with commuting actions of two different Markov groups, and we might think about uh, bimodules with R acting on both sides, or bimodules with R acting on one side, and the big algebra acting on the other side. We can see. So let me just show you what we can do when we have some very natural bimodules. So let's do a few different things to, to try and work out where what G was was given that subject. So let's ask what does the big algebra look like? As an R R bimodule. I mean certainly since R is a subalgebra, you can just multiply on the left or right by elements of R. It's automatically a bimodule. out into the number of elements of, of, uh, of G simple pieces. Uh, let's call them uh, the superscript G, so the, the group bijection with the elements of the group. And uh, RG Let's 
just like R as an R R by module, uh, except uh, it's one action twisted by the piston. Okay, so if you want to multiply it by the piston on the So if you're to multiply on the left here, you just uh, you just multiply on the left by R. But if you're to multiply on the right by some element of R, you first of all apply the the outer automorphism for G and then act like that. Okay. So uh, so you just have R with direct sum G. You just isomorphize to a direct sum of all these piston pieces. And in fact, we know the tensor product. We know that densities of the By module R twisted by G, you can see this tensor product over the over the algebra R that R tends to take. That's just the uh, the by module twisted by G. So right away you recover the entire group. Okay, you've got if you if you take this guy and decompose it into simple modules, and you know how big the group is just by how many pieces, then you can recover the group more quickly just by seeing how they see <coughs> when you tensor pair them. And so there's actually, you can sort of recover all the information about G in a, in a sort of dual way in this subchapter. So you can, you can look at this is semi direct product of tensor over R in itself. Okay, so this now, uh, well, sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you this works on a bi module. So let's think of that as an. R semi direct product of G, R semi direct product of G by module. Okay, so what does this look like? I mean, this just looks like expand by pairs of elements, one in this algebra, one in this algebra, but you can move, if you're sitting in the R sub algebra, you can move it between the two. It's just a normal algebraic tensor product, and R semi direct product G acts on either side just for multiplication of the elements. Okay, well, essentially, uh, Essentially, sort of R just gets out of the way entirely, and uh, you're really just looking at uh, sort of two copies of G with G acting on either side. So this, as I said very quickly, this has a simple sum and uh, for each theorem. So you're going to find out the way to introduce the representation of the group G. Mention of that representation, and uh, these these simple sum ends of this big module they tensor together in exactly the same way as the irreducible representation of the group G. So on one hand, we recover actually directly the elements of the group G and how they multiply, whereas by looking at this point by module and how it decomposes, we recover the representation theory of G and how those representations tensor together and decompose. We get everything uh, in a sort of pretty nice package. So let me give you another example of uh, encoding group theoretic information in a factor. Here we just looked at a single group acting. A given uh, subgroup empty inside G, we can think about uh, a, a small algebra, take the semi direct product of H, sitting inside a big algebra, take the semi direct product. So now, uh, again, I'm just going to say sort of the answer, how, how what all the bimodules look like. So the PB bimodule, the bimodules for the big algebra, again, look like rep G, that is, the simple bimodules are sort of bijected with the, with the irreducible representation here, and the tensor products match up in exactly the same way. And AB by modules look like rep H, but this this is in a slightly weaker sense. So the BB by modules they look like rep G, uh, and you can even see how to tensor how to tensor by modules together. The tensor product of by modules is just the same as the tensor product of representations of the group. 
But here it doesn't even make sense to tensor two AB bimodules because there's a long set of bimodules side by side. This one's got a, a right B axis, and the other ones have a, a left A axis, so you can't, can't take the tensor product. So we're not we're not going to be recovering the, the, the tensor product stuff with this with this little model here. Oh, but well, I don't want to go into all the details, but you can recover almost everything about C two. You don't quite you can't quite do the full reconstruction. It's a little ambiguous. But I want to use this example to tell you the definition of the principal gas of a subgas. Um, yeah, so what happens when H is normal? Um, <coughs> yes, in that case, uh, you do uh, you, you do reconstruct everything. I mean, you, there's no ambiguity in, in recovering H and G. Um, but how long are you supposed to see H not H? Uh, G not H? As the as the set, I mean, uh, as a as a oh. group or a small. Oh oh. Uh, so the maybe. <laughs> um, so the let me let me just see. So the AA bimodule is usually um, I guess it could be AA bimodules recover the representation theory of, of G one H in the normal case, but. Don't hold me. Uh, okay. So what's the principal graph? So the principal graph uh, has as vertices uh, the isomorphism classes of uh, H mu and A mu by modules. So you just have some finite set of representation. Here's some kind of set of representations here. We put all those together. Uh, and then H H is the H between uh, X and some AB by module and Y and some BB by module. So these are going to be a bipartite graph. They'll only be vertices from one sort of vertex to the other. So the edge between those. Oh, Inside, what you get by taking Z, that's the big algebra, okay, uh, thinking of that as a ZA bimodule, all of Z acts on the left, and you only allow the subalgebra A to act on the right, you tensor that over the algebra A with X, okay? This is some other BB bimodule that we produced with X. And we just count how many copies of something isomorphic to Y we see. And that tells us a graph that, that encodes a lot of information about the bimodule. Let me do an example. Um, I think it goes with this. I'm going to put it right in the corner here, although I know it's going to be kind of an extreme angle for most people. Uh, let's just do an example and see what these sort of graphs look like. Let's think about uh, S4 inside S5, the symmetric group set. Well, so I'm going to get uh, all the representations of these two groups in the two halves of the graph. And it for you so that I can explain how I got it. So out here is the AB by module, and down here are the BB by modules. And it's sort of annoying way to draw it, but I want to clearly show the bipartite structure. Really threw myself into a corner there. Uh, so, what are the, the, the BB by modules? are meant to be the representations of the big group. Now, representations of a symmetric group are just indexed by young tableau, five boxes. So, there's the, there's the trivial representation of S5. And what I've got to think about for these other guys is I've got to think well, if I take this representation of S5 and restrict down to S4, just think about the subgroup S4 acting. How would that split up into irreducible representations? Well, this is a trivial representation, so it's only going to break up into a single piece. 
the trivial representation of S4. And now, I mean, it's like you, that, that rule all by itself lets you fill in the whole table um, with, with some other young diagram indexing another some other representation of S five, and it turns out if you go look up your combinatorial representation theory, the rule for how a representation of S five splits up as a representation of S four when you restrict to S four is just you delete any box that you can delete and still get a uh, still get a young guy. So we can erase this box on the right and stuff. Or you could have got you just say you just got to get out and erase it. And so So this principal graph is just some combinatorial piece of data that we've extracted from the collection of bimodules, and we've recorded some of the information, but not all of the information, about how bimodules tensor together in decomposing the small spaces. But uh, that thing, the principal graph, will be important a little bit later. That principal graph we calculated just using purely just some old-fashioned finite group theory, understanding how representation is inductive and restrictive group to a subgroup. But, uh, but yeah, it's also something you can use for any other stuff. Okay. So now <coughs> I need to sort of formalize this notion where we started with some subfactor and we looked at a bunch of the bimodules and understood what we could do with the bimodules. Uh, and I need to sort of formalize this sort of process of analyzing a subfactor. By a, by a loop at its bottom. And so the subject uh, essentially gets to be planar algebras, and we're going to now start encoding all the information about, about the bimodules of the subfactor. But this sort of thing has a lot of different names. Something very similar was originally studied by Ottoniano and people from Paradigms. We also did it called lambda lattices, we did it in UCLA. Popper did a lot of work on this, uh, all giving slightly different axiomatizations of what I'm going to talk about now, but they're essentially trying to do the same thing, understand the bimodules for some subfactor. Uh, okay, <clears throat> so given uh, subfactor, we're going to say B, we'll start off by defining a bunch of vector spaces. First one is a series of them, next to our positive initial ends, which is just all of the, the AA bimodule maps from A, that's the small algebra, thought of as an AA bimodule, up to this guy. You take a whole lot of copies of B, each thought of as an AA bimodule you tensor them together over that smaller algebra A, and you look at uh, n factors of this. Okay. This whole thing is obviously an AA bimodule. You can act by multiply by A and the two, the two right-hand factors. And we want to study just this plain old vector space of bimodule intertwinings between these subgroups. Now, even though we started with this crazy infinite dimensional Gaussian subfactor, uh, we're going to find that very, very often these, these are finite dimensional vector spaces that we extract from, from the subject. And then similarly, we sort of need this, need this, we define some more vector spaces with a deep factor of uh, maps between B, B bimodules. So we can just think of them as first set of spaces. It looks a little bit funny that I wrote n factors here and n plus one factors here. But you can see this makes sense. I mean, if I took zero tensor factors here, okay, 
so I, I, I do since I'm doing tensor products over A, the sort of empty tensor product should be A itself, but that's not a DB binary. It doesn't even make sense to take the empty tensor product over A. Okay, there are these two spaces. Now the nice theorem. Theorem definition. Uh, I'll tell you it's in the statement of the theorem what all the planar algebra is, i.e., there is an act <coughs> this is a shaded, no, shaded planar tangents on these vectors. Find what a shaded planar tangle is by drawing a picture. It's a free disk. Let's sort of distinguish points of the boundaries that we can keep track of symmetries. And it's got some smaller disks cut out of the interior. So it would be better to mark down these ones. Like those, keep track of things. And then we finally draw some paths connecting these inner disks to each other. Subject to a few, well, oh, sorry, a little bit more data. I said shaded, so I'll get another color. And then this checkerboard shade, the regions in between the, uh, in between the, the disks. So leave that one unshaded, shade this one, shade this one, shade this one, this one. So that, that requirement that we shade things means that each disk has an even number of, of boundary points. And uh, drawn picturesquely. Goes to these diagrams of spaghetti and meatballs. Actually, we play and meatballs. Think about that. Okay. okay. So, what does it mean to have an action of shaded planar tangle? Well, it means that any diagram I can draw like this is a linear map. It takes you from the vector spaces associated with the inner disks to the vector space associated with the outer disks. And what do I mean there? So, I write down each. I look at each of the inner disks, and I count how many boundary points it. Has. So this one here has four boundary points. I divide by two just to be inconvenient. And I write down P2 plus, saying that it's got an input corresponding to this. And I look at this disk, and I see it's got six boundary points. So if I say tensor product P3 plus, and I look at this guy and see it's got two boundary points. But I also notice that the star is in a shaded group. So something a little bit funny has gone on. So I write down. Associated with this shaded, shaded planar tangle, we're doing some linear map with that vector space as its input. And from the <coughs> input, we'll just be, when we look at the outside disk, and it's got six boundary points, so we're doing some map between the two things on the top. Okay. So we've got these vector spaces, and the claim is that there's this giant system of linear maps relating all these vector spaces together. And this is an, this is an action in the sense that if I take some other Spaghetti and meatballs diagram that's, that's much smaller, and I plug it into that circle there. That gives me a new spaghetti and meatballs diagram. This, this meatball is replaced by a bunch of smaller meatballs inside. And what I want to say is that the maps compose in the appropriate way. That is, I can take, I can use the inner, the inner spaghetti and meatball diagram to act on some of the tensor factors, and then that gets shoved into this appropriate spot, and then the bigger planar tangle acts on all of the remaining ones. And the, the, the gluing together of planar tangles should match up. The composition of the multimodal vectors. Okay, so what's the what's the proof of this theorem? Well, it's it's not deep or difficult. You just have to notice it. The, the point is just that this, this sort of diagrammatic formalism exactly captures all the natural operations amongst uh, amongst bimodules uh, between two algebras. By example, let's impose all the natural operations on uh, the intertwinement between bimodules. Okay. 
example, let's say we look at two wavelength plots. So given the maps from A to the sort of the two end factors here. Well, we can think of that in a slightly different way. It turns out that uh, this, is, this is the same thing as the endomorphism as AA by an element from the, the, the end principle of G to the end principle of G. We're sort of just using a duality here. We, we've got two end factors here in the target of this, of this pond, and we're moving half of it over to the source. Okay? So that vector space that I have there is, is, is very inactive in the same as this one. And so then let's think about what we, what we might do with this tangle here, where we have two input disks stacked on top of each other. Half the string's pointing down and half the string's pointing up. Well, this map here just gives us composition in that endomorphism space. Okay? So this is the, the, the space that goes into one of these, each of these disks is just the endomorphisms of some time module, and you can compose on them. Because this map is the, is the composition map, or the multiplication map of this little planet here. On the other hand, Diagram. We have a middle disk with n strings down and n strings up, but there are no boundary points on the outside. This is this just gives us the trace on that end of the space. And you can you can see that something sort of believable is going on here, because if I uh, if I took two endomorphisms and I multiplied them by stacking them on top of each other, and then I took their trace by putting these strings around. That diagram that I produced looks sort of like this. Okay, but that diagram is is isotopic in the plane to the diagram where where f and g are the other way around. So we can see that some sort of natural identities between things we could do with intertwiners. That is, uh, a trace doesn't care about the order of multiplication inside of it. Are reflected exactly by the by things that happen automatically uh, in this diagram, just by plotting the things around. So obviously this isn't a proof. This is really sort of sketch. What you really do is you say, well, I can build up planar tangles out of certain elegant pieces, and I can associate certain maps to those, and be able to check that the various sort of diagrammatic operations that turn <laughs> one diagram into another are all actually <coughs> inspected by the, the bits of algebra we associate with that diagram. Okay, so planar algebra. This is now going to be uh, our main tool for for analyzing a subplane. So uh, I guess I need to say something about how you go backwards briefly. Very briefly, just to say it. Um, so this tells you how to start with a subfactor and produce a planar algebra. Uh, Popper has a theorem that explains how to take a planar algebra with a few extra axioms, so these are the inner product on these spaces, and these are one of your other things, and build a subfactor again, but go, going in the reverse direction. And he described exactly when that reverse construction is the inverse of this one. It's not always. Some subfactors, you lose information when you pass to the planar algebra, and you can't reconstruct the whole subfactor. But for sufficiently nice ones, I guess I'll leave that to the this planar algebra construction is, is actually a complete invariant for, for subfactors. Okay, so what do we do with all of these things? So let me give you an example of a planar algebra that also plays a very important role in the map theory. So inside any planar algebra lies the temporally leave plane. Tn TL for temporary leave, n comma plus is just the linear span of crossingless matches on uh, two endpoints. That sounds very complicated. 
fish that are the earth, it's the linear span of doing. It's the linear span, it's a field of three, but it's the linear span of the three. Slowly, as you can see, there are six boundary points around the outside of the circle. <coughs> Inside each circle, there are three strings. Strings don't cross, and you can very quickly verify that those spy over the ones crossing is not the case. So, can you see how to generalize what all the other spaces are? Um, in fact, with the minuses, they're just the same thing. There's no use to differentiate anything. Okay, why do these vector spaces have the structure of a planar algebra? Well, it's really simple. I mean, if you've got some spaghetti and meatballs diagram, you take a picture that's pure spaghetti, you replace all the meatballs with that bit of spaghetti, and you've just got a big plate of spaghetti. Okay? Just across from the matching at the end. Except, you've got to be a little bit careful. There might be um, some closed loops in there, and you plug them all into this one. So, we've got to say an extra thing here. Uh, and when you compose these, you replace closed circles uh, with some, some number. Chosen from which number there. Okay? And that then tells you how to resolve the planar composition of any two Hilbert triangles and add another thing. Okay. Now, not only is this a planar algebra, it's sort of a universal one. It sits inside any other planar algebra. Why is that? Well, because each of these pictures is itself a, plane, a, a shaded planar tangle with no input disks. So you can think of this as, some, as a map going from no inputs, so just the complex numbers, to uh, p n plus, whatever our p was. Okay? So this diagram is a spaghetti and meatball diagram with no inputs. It goes from c to p p plus, whatever p was. So it gives us a thing. If you look at the image of one, it gives you a canonical algebra. That is, you can, in any planar algebra, you have elements corresponding to Sorry, that yep. replaced the little circle with some complex <coughs> number. Yep. Is that a, a shaded disk? Uh, or yeah, okay, so I should have. Um, I drew it as shaded, but that just is confusing because we can replace the other shaded disk also with the same complex number. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess I, I drew it with the shading because this is the conventional formalism for planar algebras, but there's a much better one where you replace the two circles with different complex numbers that, that still multiply to delta squared. And the number theory of all of this subject gets way better if you do that. So I'm used to right. saying them separately, but there's a little closed circle that just replaces delta, ignoring it. Okay. Now, I've got the thing. Is that right? Okay. I should eventually talk about something that I've found, um, which isn't all inconsistent. Okay. So we need one more little definition. Crash course on subclasses. An index of A inside B uh, defined by Jenner is one of three different things. Either it's a delta squared, the same delta, if you look at a little closed loop in the planar algebra and see what multiple of the empty diagram it is, that's some complex number and just write that down. Alternatively, it's the uh, Square of the graph norm of this principal graph. So here, it's square of the largest eigenvalue of the principal of the basis norm of the principal graph. I'm running a little bit behind time, let me just say the third one, which is just that forgetting all of this theory we've set up, this big algebra B is, an, is a left A module, and there's this notion of Murray von Neumann dimensions and modules over von Neumann algebras, and index is just the Murray von Neumann dimension of the index. And you can check that all of these things defined in very different ways via this planar formalism, via this combinatorics we extracted from the bimodules, and from the original sort of Hilbert spaces and projections set up of Murray von Neumann dimensions, all give you the same thing. Okay, so we're now ready to at least state the sort of problem that uh, 
me and lots of other people who like subfactors have been working on the last couple of years. Vaughan, again another theorem of his, uh, showed that this index of the subfactors is pointer. Right, let's just let me write the index of a, a group or a field. That square bracket is colon. <coughs> index is pointer. The marker of that is the index of any subfactor of A inside B. It's either of the form four cosine squared pi over n. Or, on the other hand, maybe it's bigger than the form, in which case we don't get the same thing at least the form is the same. Okay, this is a, was a remarkable result, and um, I think by itself is actually a fine part of uh, well, this is this is this is this is, uh, this is a fun result that after the fact has very easy proofs, much easier than the ones that Vaughan originally came up with, uh, but it's still a good result. So the sketch of the proof. That Vaughan came up with is that you look at this temporary leave subalgebra and you realize that it couldn't possibly have be unitary, it couldn't possibly have a positive definite inner product of all these vector spaces unless delta was equal to the inner space. But there are, there are even easier arguments. Okay. Then what this sort of gives us something to aim at, a way to sort of uh, understand the size of subfactors. There's the little one that sit under the four and the big ones over four, and, uh, and a way of organizing. There's a beautiful ADB classification. This classification uh, where it gets below four. And it's sanctioned with sort of temporary leaves and sort of this relatives exhaust everything that you see below four. There's a not quite as beautiful, but still pretty nice classification at index exactly four. And then after a while, well, then for a while there's a bit of a pause. Like what about above four? Oh, oh, so I mean, uh, so A, D, E here are referring to Dinkin diagrams, and A, D, and E Dinkin diagrams. So it turns out that if you index below four, the principal graph is either some A graph, just a string of vertices, or a D graph, just a string of vertices, except for minimal forks, or an E graph, just a finite piece of graph, where there's a fork that it loves you. And um, not only is this classification sort of, not only are the principal graph these A, D, and E graphs, they're actually connections with other A, D, and E classifications in the genus, but they're sort of these graphs that show up in the two correspondence, the same graph showing up. Okay, so what about above four? Well, it turns out that you can arrange, you can set up a version of temporary leave that achieves any index value four, any any number four or, or bigger. So you might say, okay, problem is done. This is really the, the actual set of indices achieved. But temporary leave somehow is, a, is an extremely simple subfactor. It's not very interesting. And once you leave out temporary leave, the story becomes much, much more interesting. And people first of all notice that there's a gap above four that can prove there's some little index range uh, above four where there were no possible subfactors except the set of boring ones coming from temporary leaf. And then people noticed that all the examples they had were, were at particularly interesting index values and not at uh, random complex numbers. And then we finally started to get classification results that, um, that said a lot more about that. So let me, Wait, can I ask yeah, yeah, yeah. So above four is still quantized, but it's somewhat interesting. Well, uh, sorry. Um, so if you allow uh, just this temporary leaf planar algebra, where these, the, the planar algebra just has these elements, which are always there, but nothing more, then you can achieve any index you like. Four plus pi, go for it. Okay, where's the subfactor? But if you ask for only those subfactors, only subfactors which differ from some way in temporary leaf, 
uh, there's more in their primary algorithm than just these one bonds, then what we start to discover is that the index is, well, it's not discrete, there are accumulation points, but, it, but, it, but there are gaps and that's an issue. Uh, and I, I mean, I'm not going to explicitly say what we can say a little bit about the bonds. <coughs> Let me, I guess, just jump straight to the theorem. Uh, uh, indulge me for a moment while I write my own thesis name. Because uh, I think you may find that uh, it's a work with seven different papers and a whole series of not quite but not overlapping co authors. Say is that there are n subfamilies besides just the plain old triple relief ones. This index is a typical greater than four but strictly less than five. It turns out we know exactly what happens at five as well, but we haven't really done yet. Um, and there's ten. Examples come in five pairs, and then there's a series of main numbers. Where are the princes? Yeah. Yep. Where's the princes? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the 24th algorithm sub factor. And I have extended algorithm. Mystery for ten or so years. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then the Seda Hagra. Seda Hagra is a big deal in this subject. Uh, didn't want to actually devote it to the graph. Uh, you can see we're not too good at naming these things. We just do too much naming for a while and then we just start using. One one subfactor, and we got two 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 one. Oh, two 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 one subfactor. And now, in some sense, nearly all of these ones, maybe with the exception of this guy, are really just strange and sporadic objects. Uh, we, I talked at the beginning about how to get subfactors from finite group data. Those are all all using things that integers. Four and five and six and so on. You can get other things that come from quantum groups of recent unity, but these examples are very unlike those. And so far, we really don't have uh, sort of uniform explanations of where these come from. They don't come from families, <coughs> they don't come from quantum groups, they don't come from finite groups. They're just these strange sporadic objects. And I think that it's reasonable to say that certainly these first two never would have been discovered uh, except for. Attempts to, to actually classify what's out there and then work with this guy, uh, what there is. So I think I'm really fine for a few minutes. Is that right? I guess. Do you want to do that? Okay. <laughs> I can say anything I want. <laughs> okay. Okay. So let me uh, just give a very view from 10,000 feet of how such a theorem gets proved. Um, actually, before I do that, let me just say one or two things about reasons why you might care about such a theory, um, even if you think that subfactors are extremely boring, um, which is that, uh, which is basically that you should come to my other talk tomorrow, um, <laughs> where, I'll, uh, where I'm not going to mention the word subfactor, but I'm going to be talking about some gadgets that are very closely related to this. I'm going to give a little picture you should have in mind that subfactors are very close to the world of fusion categories. Basically a fusion category is just remembering just the AA binomials and not all the, not all the other stuff that you might think is a subfactor. And fusion categories are very closely related to topological field theories, which I will definitely talk about tomorrow. And uh, these are fabulous things to involve real physics and might actually be useful 
for someone who wants to go out and, and do something in the world, besides lecture. Um, and so this connection, I think, by itself, to me, I think it's great justification for understanding subfactors, because let us understand fusion categories to maybe understand the small, simple examples of double integral field theories that might show up in your physics. Okay. So from 10,000 feet, how on earth do you prove this theorem? Step one, a uh, whole lot of combinatorics. Uh, and curiously enough, number theory uh, constrain the possible proof. This step, you don't get down to just these five cases. You get down to these five cases and a bunch of infinite families and a few other things to deal with. But at least you, you have a vague idea of what the possible principal graphs of subfactors uh, in the index domain you're looking for. And then you do a bunch of representation theory, in some sense, sort of very analogous to the representation theory of Lie algebras, but somehow sort of finite dimensional algebras that naturally arise in finite optimal. Bunch of representation theory and uh, stain theory. Again, I'll talk a little bit about tomorrow. So these are sort of uh, two dimensional topologies, playing with diagrams as well as applying modular simulations uh, to constrain not just this combinatorial thing, <coughs> oh, this very possible. So now you go do some representation theory and, and, and stain theory to constrain the possible plane algebras. Essentially, this is saying something like, well, if you're going to have a planar algebra with this principal graph, then it's going to have some element in the eighth, in the in the P8 space satisfying the following identities, and another element satisfying these identities. And uh, the more you learn about the sort of elements that must exist and identities that must hold, the, the more constrained that planar algebra is. And then you go do a bunch of, I'm not really sure what you're going to call this, I'm going to call it applied algebraic geometry, which just means solving ridiculously large systems of polynomial equations, sometimes by numerical methods, sometimes by, by exact methods, to produce uh, candidate planar algebra. Inside, uh, certain, well, inside certain, I'm going to say standard ones, but let me just tell you an analogy to this point. Uh, say you think that you've got some finite proof given by, by generators and relations, but you're not sure that it really exists. I mean, or you're, you're not sure rather that these <coughs> relations don't collapse it all down to the trivial group. What can you do? Well, you can go look inside some sufficiently big symmetric group and try and find a bunch of elements satisfying those elements. And this is really what we do here have some ideas of relations that ought to hold your planar algebra. So we try and, in, we try and find that as a sub-algebra of some, of some easier to define. And that usually involves doing lots of solving polynomial equations. And then finally, once you've got these candidates that you found as sub-algebras, you have to do a bunch more scheme theory to show Sure they are what you that is, it's a candidate object you came up with. You only have the right principal graphs. You really satisfy all the axioms of planar algebras. You thus find the deconstruction theory. You need to do subfactors. Following all those steps for some particular index range, the index range is chosen according to what makes all of this feasible. You get theories like this. Okay. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, I can write them down. There's, they're kind of fun numbers. Um, uh, this one's 5 plus root 13 over 2. This one I can't write down because it's, I mean, it's about 4 times 10 to the 10 something. Um, <laughs> um, I forget what number this is, but it, it's, in, it's in some non abelian six order extension of axioms that I can't write it down. Uh, this one is 5 plus root 17 over 2. This one is sort of off by itself, that's e plus square root e. This one's 5 plus root 
Now you might look at those numbers and say, oh, there's an obvious pattern. These guys obviously live in a series. And if you ever have any explanation of what these three have to do with each other, I'd love to hear it, because they apparently have nothing to do with each other, even though the index values are very simple numbers that sit in, sit in a very natural series. Um, there's sort of an explanation for why there's this funny coincidence, why the numbers look kind of similar. Um, there are very, very strong number genetic constraints with possible index values, and there just aren't that many numbers that satisfy those sort of those sort of purely number constraints. It's my feeling is that it's an accident that the human genome is the way it is. Just you know, looking at the genome and saying, oh, they don't seem to be related. Yes, Jeff. Um, you say they come Oh yeah, okay. So yep, yep. So um, it's a little bit difficult to say because the pairs, but these four are, are of a different nature than the pairs that we have. Okay. So here, um, so there's always, so given a subfactor A inside B, uh, there's always a, a dual subfactor. We can make this guy called, uh, let's call it A1, and we'll get to the origin of that, which is basically that when you're going to include these pairs, it's a natural uh, uh, projection. It's not an algebra now, but it's a projection. It's squashing B back down into the, the subalgebra A. And so let's just take A1, which is the algebra generated by all the elements of B, and just project it back down here. And so there's B sitting sitting inside A1, which is what's called the dual subfactor. And it's, it, it, this is a duality in the sense that you do this twice, and you get back something, you get back what you start with. So these four, just come in that way, that it's a subfactor that is dual. Uh, but in terms of the planar algebras, that just means you inverse all the shapings in the guy, you exchange the roles of B and pluses and A's and A's. This one is, is quite different. Um, this, the two, the pair here are, are the subfactor and it's called what's called G. So you can only really say what it means in terms of, well, I only know how to say it in terms of the planar algebras, but basically if you just take those vector spaces I described, and take the complex function of vector spaces, but use the same linear maps. You get something that's just, you get a different object. And it turns out that these examples are all real when you perform complex conjugations, get the same thing back, whereas, but this one you don't. This one, on the other hand, is self-dual, so you can perform this construction and get the same thing back. So a priori, you should get four things from this example. Did I, did I get it wrong? Perhaps. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was oh. thinking of Aspergedian Yeah, that's good. Um, yeah. So you said that you get edges going from the AB to the DB. So this is all directed? Is uh, that right? Well, okay. yes. Yeah, so it's um, so it's symmetric. I mean, it turns out it's symmetric. So what the rule here, what was it? You had X of AB plus Y of DB. And we counted how many copies of Y there were sitting inside, what was it, B to the 0 over A of X. So we turned this guy into a BB binomial, and we said it's the only way to do it, and we see how many copies of Y sit inside. But it turns out that sort of the, the number of Ys sitting inside there, I mean, one way to say that is this is just sort of the, um, the dimension of, of the home space from Y into there. It's another way of counting how many copies of Y there are. Um, but that home space is, is really just the same Z from sort of zoom out, move B to the other side, and you get B to the sort of over uh, B to the sort of over A like that. And then you can <coughs> switch the order around. And because everything sort of maps on the same simple, you can sort of unitary. Iteratively map to the guy, and you get these guys that are like this sort of duality that we have here. Oh, that's all right. Yeah. Wait for it to pass. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. So what maps? I mean, you 
Oh, what's next? 